Hello and welcome back for the fourth installment of the RNA-seq tutorial guidelines for Dr. Pedro Mira's Biology 792 class. This is spring 2019 at the University of Nevada, Reno. So just a quick recap. We pulled some files out, we extracted them, we aligned them using HiSAP, we sorted them in made BAM files using SAM tools out of our SAM files. We used SAM tools to index our BAM files so that we could load them up into IGV. And we used IGV tools to visualize some things. Um, last time, I didn't get the opportunity to show you this. I forgot to. But we will right now um, open this up right here. So this is just a picture visualizing in IGV the male and female um, chromosome X, this should say ZIST right here, XIST, that gene, so we can see that in males and in females we have some differential expression today. And we're going to look at that in our ball gown. We're going to make a little plot and we're going to show you. Um, so that was pretty cool. I forgot to do that last time, but here are all the male samples, female samples and we can see some differential expression pattern too. Anyway, looking at our protocol, here it shows five distinct isoforms. I'll show you today that using my data, for whatever reason, this isoform does not show up. And I was trying to brainstorm, trying to think um, why that could be true and why this isn't showing up for me with my data and my data analysis today. The one and only thing that I could think of was right here where we um, filter and subset um, to remove low abundance genes. I'm not sure if that would remove a, an isoform of a gene. Um, totally not sure. That was just what I was thinking. If you guys have any ideas, leave them in the comment box below. Um, and then our results transcripts for when we plot our transcripts later in the protocol could just not have plotted that transcript either. Once again, if you guys have any idea what's going on here, let me know in the comment box. I'll try to fix that and maybe post a new video showing that all five isoforms but today we're just going to soldier on and we will see that this will not appear here and we'll get the other four isoforms and we will get good expression patterns like we see here though all right so in the protocol we're going to start on step number seven run differential expression analysis protocol so last time i mentioned that Oh, and here we go. We use string tie to merge in our transcripts. We use GFF compare to check out how the transcripts compare with the reference genome annotation. And then we use our string tie to create our ball gown output files. Boom, boom, boom. So last time I said that you can use Conda to install ball gown if you'd like to in R. Um, if this doesn't work for you, I've also included some code down here so you can install packages ball gown actually in R. We're going to be working with R Studio today. So I'm just going to open up R Studio. Just type that in the command line right there. Let me get that output. And I'll use this terminal to show you some of the CSV files that we're going to create. Anyway, Here's a big annotated list of all the commands that I'll go through today. But for sake of working in our studio, I've made this little nifty script. Um, if you wanted to, you could just type the command r script into your ball gown dot underscore script dot r and this would run your R script from the command line. Now, like I said, 
we're gonna be working in our studio today, so we're not gonna need that. But I just thought I'd throw that out there for y'all if you wanted to not work in our studio, not work in R, and just write your R script. You're using this um, handle right here, so this shows you what you're gonna be working in. User bin R, so that tells you that this is the R language. And the computer is going to read it as R script and run it as R script using R from the command line. Anyway, that was a little tangent. So we've typed in R studio, bada bing, bada boom. Let me exit out of this. Let's go to R studio again. Let's open up a fresh, fresh R studio works uh, workplace. Haha. -ha. I don't know why this is all here. But we're going to open up a fresh R Studio. So as you can see, I've got my R script in here. And like I said, just for the sake of running the code, it's not annotated. But I'll go through the annotations as we run the code. So I'm going to put this over on this side so we can see running code here. We can look at our annotations over here. So like I said, we can install our package ball gown using the install.packages function in our um, command, if you will. So now that we have R or R Studio loaded, if you're using R, you can just type R from the command line. Bada bing, bada boom, pops up. We need to load the packages that we're going to be using. And if you have not currently, if you do not currently have these packages, you can utilize this command above the install packages command. Um, to install ballgown and to install the other packages that we're going to be using. Our color brewer, um, I couldn't get our Skittle brewer to install. They use our Skittle brewer in the protocol, but I decided to use our color brewer and I've included my code down here just in case. I've also included the our Skittle brewer code down there if you would like to use that. Um, we're going to be using gene filter. Um, Rovars is a gene filter command, so we're going to need that. And that's calculation of mean of variances. We're going to use dplyr or dipler, whatever you want to call it, to sort and arrange our results. And then we're going to use dev tools to ensure reproducibility and install the relevant packages that we're going to need to run some of this code down in here. Alrighty. So like I said, if you need to install any of the above packages, they can be used or installed using the install.packages command. So now, after we load our packages, let's load these up real quick. I'm just going to hit control enter on each line of script. And we've got all the packages that we're going to need loaded. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to read in our phenotype data, which are contained in a CSV file, which are loaded in the chromosome X, for me it's the lowercase c, chromosome X data directory. So let me show you what this file looks like. So we're going to change into our chromosome X data file, and here it is. It's this Guvedis phenotype or phenodata.csv. Let's open that up. And this is where I was able to get those male female um, designations for each of the samples. And this is from Nairobi, I believe, is what YRI stands for, and GBR stands for Great Britain. So Nairobi and Great Britain populations for male and female across these samples. So this is what our phenodata is going to look like, and that's what we're about to load up into R. So without further ado, let's load up this. Let me save that real quick. Let's get back over here. We're going to set our working directory because we're going to be working in my where my ball gown files are stored. So let me show you that again. So my ball gown directory is in this file path, or directory path, I guess you could say, and that's my ball gown, um, where my ball gown directory is located. So that is where I'm going to set my working directory to. Next, 
we're going to load up that pheno data using the read.csv command and I'm going to give it the full path to the pheno data just to make it nice and simple bada bing bada boom there we go load it up and as we can see it's the same exact file that we were just looking at max it out of that so we don't clutter our workspace alrighty so now that we've loaded up our phenotype data we're going to read in the expression data that we generated using string tie and right now as you can see this is not our syntax so let's view this in our syntax Ta -da. so everything from now on is going to be viewed in what you would see in our syntax my R studio I've arranged it so that it's a little bit I don't know I'm gonna I can mess with the colors and whatnot but I won't do that now so we're gonna read in our expression data we generated using string tie so we're gonna come back to our R studio over here and we're gonna read in that and here it is we have it under the name VG underscore CHRX, so ball gown. And this is all of our um, data that we generated using string tie. And now we're going to filter this. So we'll come back to our annotation. We're going to filter to remove low abundance genes. Now, looking at this, I kind of go back on what I said earlier about filtering to remove low abundance genes. I'm not super sure that it would remove isoforms of sub, you know, of a subset of genes, but like I said, leave me a comment. Let me know what I'm doing wrong. All right, so we're gonna now we're gonna filter these guys, and we'll see that populate over in our global environment. And here's that. Next. We're going to identify transcripts that show statistically significant differences using this right here. So we're going to put that into our results transcripts data frame and we're going to use stat test. We're going to use our BG chromosome X filtered and we're going to use the feature transcript covariate of sex adjust vars for population get FC is true means in FPKM, which if we hold down here, fragments per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads is what that stands for. So let's run this piece of code. And we get our results transcripts file. So here's our FC values. Let's look at what the FC values are. Super sure. Uh, fold change. Cool. So that's what FC stands for. Fold change. These are color we were on. So fold change. Increase. About the same. Decrease. Increase. So we see our full change values, our p values, and our q values. All right, get FC. That's what that means. Okay, identification of genes that show statistically significant differences. So we did transcripts. Now we're going to do genes, and again, we're going to use stat test in our ball ground filtered um, environment variable with the feature gene as the covariate as sex. And we're going to adjust the bars for the variance is for population, and we're going to get our FCs, and we're going to get our means, our MES, in FPKM, MEAS, and FPKM. So let's come over here. Let's out of that. So results, and we're going to save that in, in a data frame called results genes and populate it over here and now we can see that our results genes labeled by the ID we can go up and down we can check out the different labelings of IDs and now that's saved in there alrighty next we're gonna add gene names and IDs to our results 
transcripts. So we're going to be using the data frame. We're going to create a new data frame. It says gene names ballgown. We're going to pull the gene names out of ballgown using our BG chromosome X filtered um, environment variable. Our gene IDs are going to come from ballgown gene IDs in that same, and then we're going to write it to the transcript. So let's do this. And we wrote our gene names to that environment variable results transcripts. Coolio. Soldiering on. Now we're going to sort these results transcripts and results genes to obtain smallest to largest p values. So using the results transcripts environment variable, we're going to arrange results transcripts by p values, as well as results genes. We're going to arrange results genes by p-value as well. So let's do that. One, two. P-value is now arranged from smallest to largest p-values. We'll come back down here and we can see 0 0.99 is the largest and 1.98 times 10 to the minus 11 is the smallest. And we'll check out our transcripts too. 1.23 to the minus 10, smallest, 0.9998, largest. Alrighty. Now, we're going to write our results to CSV files. And we're going to name them chromosome X transcript underscore results dot CSV and results transcripts, results genes, we're going to name them that as well. So, let's do that real quick, and then I'll show you that these guys have populated in here. Where is our results transcripts? Chromosome X gene results, chromosome X transcript results, not CSV. So we have these two CSV files that we just wrote from our results genes and results transcripts environment variables. All right. What's next? Now we're going to identify transcripts and genes with Q values less than 0 0.05. So statistically significant. Q values, I guess you could say. Let me come over here. We're going to be using the subset command or function. Results, transcripts, results, transcripts, and we're going to pull out the Q values that are less than 0.05. Populates this really nice little table here. So, our Q values, let's look at what Q values are used for. So, a Q value is a p-value that has been adjusted for the false discovery rate. The false discovery rate is the proportion of false positives you can expect to get from a t-test. So, there's our Q value. So that is our that is pulling out the key values that are less than 0.05 for our result transcripts. So now we're going to do the same thing for genes. Let me get this nice little table here, and these are the gene IDs, and these are the key values that are less than 0.05 for results genes. Alrighty. So in the protocol, this is an optional step, so you can add whatever colors you want to your plots to make them stand out. I'm using our color brewer, but the protocol uses our Skittle brewer. Either will work fine. So if you're going to use our color brewer, like me, um, I had to compile, if I wanted to install our Skittle brewer on mine, I would have to compile from the GitHub or pull from GitHub or something like that. And I was just kind of like, whatever, our color brewer is already installed, so I'll use our color brewer. So. I created a new variable called colors, and my this is the command for our color brewer, brewer.pal. 
this is the number of colors that you're going to be that you want and then this is the color palette that you're going to be using so as you guys have already seen here is the R color brewer palettes so I'm using the RDBU palette right here and how I came up with this code is you guys can go to this website right here ncees.ucsb.edu forward slash tilde Frazier forward slash r spatial guides forward slash color palette cheat sheet dot pdf so this is where I got that code I didn't know how to use it in the first place so that's where I got that code um, so the argument has so the function has an argument for the number of colors and the color palette so number of colors they had in here is four set three according to the protocol that we were using I just counted up the number of colors they had here one two three four five and I used five colors and the set I used again was RD right here so I came over here and set the number of data classes to five I selected the diverging because that's where RDBU was and I got the I selected the fifth one which is RDBU if we count over here we got one two three four five one two three four five and these are the colors that it spits out here's the red the salmon or the peach white light blue dark blue so we'll see what happens when we plot our uh, when we make our plots and we'll see the different colors that come up and what they're used for all right so that's our color brewer so again here's the cheat sheet this is where I got the code from brewer.pal set it to five and then I use the RDBU palette so I set that to colors and then I made I used the command palette and inserted my variable colors so let's run this real quick there we go populates here so these are the actual color coordination I guess you know this is the technical writing for the different colors they don't use like blue green yellow these these numerical and um, alphabetical characters here to designate the different colors and then let's enter the palette so we've initialized our palette using our colors and like I said this is the code for our skittle brewer so if you wanted to use our skittle brewer you could use this code right here I've included that and then again I will update the RNA seq tutorial um, this guideline I'll copy paste this into the comment box below so that you can copy paste this into your own text file I'll also link this ballgown script so that you can copy paste this into your own text file too and load it up into R without all of the annotations if you desire alright moving on distribution of gene abundances in FPKM or fragments per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads across samples and colored by sex so we're going to use the FPKM we're going to set this FPKM we're going to use the text PR um, command we're going to use our BGCRX right here environment variable MEAS means is FPKM we're going to use FPKM again and we're going to do a log 2 FPKM plus 1 so we're going to log transform these and then we're going to make a box plot of FPKM we're going to color these as numeric values phenodata against sex is 2 and that's our y axis right there all right let's jump over here so there's our fpkm populated over here log transform our fpkm 
make our block box plot. So consistent with the protocol, our box plot shows up quite nicely. Let me show you their box. Oh, going the wrong way. Let me show you their box plot. So this is their box plot, and our box plot matches pretty much spot on. So the salmon or peach color are males. Here they have the males in blue, and our dark red are our females. Sweet. We made a plot. Now what we're going to do is we're going to plot individual transcripts across samples. So we're going to use ballgown to pull out our transcript names. And we're not using transcript 12. This is actually going to be transcript 10. Um, so when I ran my ball gown, or my string tie rather, it populated the same gene that they're using in the protocol as 10 instead of 12. And so they used 12, and that gave them NM0. 12227 or GTP BP6. So if we scroll down here, it says step 16 the transcripts and genes you assembled, shown in tables 3 and 4 respectively, have different values for gene ID and transcript name than what you see in the protocol here. So, possible reason the transcript and gene identifiers assigned by string tie, by default preceded by the string MSTRG are generated in the order that the bundles of reads are processed. This order can differ from one run, run, one run of string tie to another when multiple threads are used with the dash p option. So up here, let's go back up to our string tie. They use dash p, or no, yep, they use the dash p of 8. If we go back up to our string tie code, we use a dash p of 11, right here. So that could be, that could explain the difference right there. Either way, I was able to figure out from the results genes, no, nope, sorry, results transcripts that are exist. I'm sorry, where are we at? Transcript names, gene names. Okay. Transcript names. Transcript names. So we're going to be using 1657 for ZIST instead of, what did they use here? I think they used 1729. Yep, they used 1729. And instead of 12 for GTPBP6. We're going to be using Okay, past it. GTP BP6, we're going to be using 10. That's our ID that we got out. So we're going to be using 10 for GTP BP6. And for our ZIST gene, we're going to be using 1657. Your outcomes may very well differ as well. Um, just hit this results transcripts table, go look for ZIST, and go look for... GTP BP6, check out the ID number. Ours is 10. In the protocol, they use 12 and 1729. But as I'll show you here, we'll get the same type of plots that they got. All right, so we're going to enter this command, and it's just going to return. So this is just going to return the transcript name. And then this command is going to return the gene name, and it's going to print to screen transcript name, 
10 and m 0 1 2 2 2 7 gene name gtp bp6 now we're going to plot these things we're going to plot the fpkm of our gtp bp6 using our pheno data we're going to extract the sex these are our borders main is paste ball gown gene name so this is our main title and we're going to use gtp bp6 transcript names gtp bp6 so it's going to print nm012227 colon gtp bp6 above our graph above our plot rather and x axis y axis all right let's do it So there's one, there's two. So, as we saw, the first one just plotted, oh, just made our box plot with no points. Second one adds points to the box plot. Cool yet. So there's our second box plot, there's our box plot, right? And let's compare that. So what they had here. It's got the same x and y axis, x and y axes rather. The scale is a little different, which could result in these different um, looking box plots. So they start at seven and a half. So you can see that this right here starts right about 8, goes all the way up past 9, I don't know that they can show 9.5 over here, and this would go far down past, down to 7.5, the average, yep, so we did get a little bit of a different picture here, but that also could be because of the runs and how it's compiled and different things like that, but this is what our box plot looks like to their box plot. And your box plot might look different. Who knows? So plot transcripts. So we're going to look at plot structure and expression levels of all transcripts that share the same gene locus within a single sample. So we're going to plot transcripts, ball gown, gene IDs, we're going to pull out, not 1729, but 1657. BG chromosome X. It's going to be our title. We're not going to be using 234. I like, um, or I guess we are. Are we going to be using 234? I kind of wanted to use. I like the way 337 looked. It really showed a nice difference in the colors. Cool. So we're going to plot our transcripts now. There you go. Like I said, I don't know what happened to the fifth isoform. Poof. But as we saw with our plot, our plot also looked different. Fifth isoform looked, just disappeared. I don't know what happened to it. They show this isoform right here that we are not showing. But this isoform, this isoform right here, we can see. This isoform right here, we can see right here. We can see that isoform right here. We can see this as a form right here. The main difference is this as a form right here is this as a form right here is the high the most highly expressed isoform. So expression by transcript as we go from zero to what is that arbitrary value of five ninety five point five eight, we see this is 
595.58 and these are closer to the back end over here between 0 and what does that look like 65.84 so like I said don't know what happened to that one but we have the other four and I guess the main point was to show that this isoform is the most highly expressed okie dokie finally we're going to make our final plot we're going to plot the average expression levels for all transcripts of a single gene across all samples so we're going to use the same exact gene that they used mstrg.56 we're going to plot means we're going to be using our bg chromosome x filtered environment we're going to group them by sex and we're not going to have a legend let's do it here we are so female male expression patterns we can see the darker they are the more highly expressed so we can see this isoform in males is more highly expressed than females these isoforms look similarly similarly expressed and we can see that this isoform right here it's more expressed in females than males. So this gives us a lot of good data. There's a lot of different isoforms here, it looks like. And if we compare that graph, oh, they don't even have that graph for this one. So I guess that's just a uh, nice little additional piece of code right there for y'all. So we can flip back through our graphs here. We double plotted points on this one, so let's just remove that one. So this was our first box plot. Right here is in this piece of code. It looked pretty much the same. This is our plot right here of our transcript, our gene names and our transcript names. So here's a gene name, here's a transcript name. So we plotted GTP BP6 in the log fold of FK, FPKM plus 1, log 2. Again, sex, female, male. Females in the dark red, males in the peach or salmon, if you will. Here's our gene zist in sample 188337. We can see that this isoform is the most abundantly expressed. The other three having very minimal expression, with this isoform being a little bit more expressed than these two isoforms, and not really being able to distinguish between these two. This has got a little bit of a darker yellow, so it's a little bit further along. But these guys are down here. This guy is obviously way up there. So that was our plot transcripts. Piece of code right here. And then our final one was plotting the transcripts across all samples from male and female. Make sure that the average expression levels for all transcripts of a single gene across samples. That's what that one looks like. And then I threw in a nice little piece of encouragement here. I'm, I'll read it for y'all. You have now completed the HiSat string tie ball gown protocol published by Pertea et al. 2016. Now that you have finished the protocol, you can retool this code to fit your own data. And personally, I will actually be doing this myself with some real data that I haven't even analyzed yet, and I hope to bring you guys on that journey um, and make some future videos of this process. So I thank you for venturing with me on this learning experience, and I hope to hear from you in the comments and hope to get some feedback on my own data exploration adventures. So if you have any ideas of why the fifth isoform disappeared or why our box plot looks a little bit different and these values are kind of different, um, hit me in the comments below. I know that not everything is a perfect science, right? And I mean, this one looked exactly the same pretty much. But this one and this one were a little bit different. If you have any ideas why that could be, um, I don't know, this should be a pretty reproducible protocol, right? Like I said, these ones, this one looked pretty good. 
And we got some, yep, we got some good. These are mean bars right here. Some pretty good outliers. So I can't really think of anything why I ran the same exact code doing the same exact thing. Maybe it was because of the string tie and how it compiled using 11 threads versus 8. Maybe if I go back and do 8 threads, I'll get the exact same graphs. Who knows? Um, let's also check out. They don't have really anything in here about the graphs looking different. Um, this is the really only thing that I could think about it. Um, but if you have any other ideas, let me know. Once again, my name is Alexander Selvi, and this has been the fourth installment, fifth really, of the RNAC tutorial, the fifth and final installment of the RNAC tutorial guidelines for Dr. Pedro Mira's Biology 792 class, spring 2019 at the University of Nevada, Reno. Like I said, I hope to see you guys out there analyzing your own data. Um, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, or any ideas of why maybe I got some different graph looking graphs than what they had in the paper hit me in the comment box below I'll link this I'll just copy paste this into the comment box along with this ball ground script without the annotations for you guys to use remember you can run this one from the command line using our script um, capital R lowercase s c r i p t and it'll do exactly what we did here for you without having to be in our studio or in our alright guys keep living the dream and I wish you well in your bioinformatics data exploration adventures